Welcome to the Adult Obesity Guideline webinar series hosted by the Office of Lifelong Learning at Obesity Canada. My name is Denise campbell Sheridan. I'm the Associate Dean for the Office of Lifelong Learning and Physician Learning Program, as well as a family physician here at the University of Alberta. It was my great pleasure to serve on the executive of the Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines. The new Clinical Practice Guidelines are expansive, 19 chapters on a wide range of topics re related to obesity diagnosis and management, weight bias, and more all written by Canada's top researchers, health practitioners, and patient advisors. They're the first truly patient-centered clinical practice guidelines on obesity and the result of more than three years of hard work. Just before we begin, um, we're gonna go through uh, some items. So we acknowledge that we're on the traditional territories across Canada of the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. So we are very pleased today to have Dr. Jimeno Ramos-Salas here with us to present on methods for the adult obesity guidelines. Dr. Ramos-Salas has a PhD in public health with a specialization in exercise, uh, health promotion and social behavioral sciences from the University of Alberta in Edmonton. She currently works as Director of Research and Policy at Obesity Canada. Jimena also works as a research and policy consultant with the European Association for the Study of Obesity and is a technical obesity consultant with the World Health Organization in the Regional Office for Europe. So welcome, Jimena. Thanks so much. So it is my pleasure to be here today and share a little bit with you about the process that we uh, embarked on to develop the Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines for uh, the Management of Obesity in Adults. And um, I'm going to be joined later by uh, Dr. Diana Sheriff Ali, who, who will be part of the panel, as uh, Denise mentioned, and um, everybody else uh, will also be able to answer some of your questions. So the objective for today is to share uh, the Canadian process for developing the new clinical practice guidelines for the management of obesity in adults. And I wanted to start by answering one of the most common questions that uh, we get is, why did you update the Canadian clinical practice guidelines? And um, this, this was uh, something that, you know, was not an easy decision for us to make at Obesity Canada because we know that developing clinical practice guidelines require a significant amount of effort and resources. And uh, we as a registered charity uh, have been focused on disseminating the previous Canadian clinical practice guidelines for a long time. And um, uh, when we were discussing this with our scientific committee and our experts, we realized that there was a time, the time to update the guidelines was now because there's a clear lack of understanding of obesity as a chronic disease in Canada, um, which is partly driven by the unclear definition of obesity uh, and that this clear lack of um, uh, understanding of obesity as a chronic disease is leading to increased weight bias and stigma and discrimination for people living with obesity. And that stigmatization of people living with obesity is causing reduced screening for obesity and reduced diagnosis for obesity, as well as less interventions for people living with obesity, which in turn, according to the epidemiological studies that we've seen, and you heard from Dr. Lori Twells in the previous webinar, has led to a disease progression at the population level where we see an increase in prevalence of obesity uh, for uh, various levels, including uh, really a 400% increase in the prevalence of severe obesity. And of course, this is leading to a lot of obesity stigma in, and also more health inequalities at the population level. So in our approach, we we started by really sitting down with our stakeholders to really define the vision of the new Canadian clinical practice guideline. And we came up with this vision. We wanted to develop a non-biased, scientifically valid and trustworthy set of clinical practice guidelines with specific recommendations on the management of obesity to inform clinical decision-making that is patient-centered and to support shared decision-making in order to optimize patient care. And what we wanted to do is really target these clinical practice guidelines to primary care providers, including uh, practitioners that work uh, on their own in their clinical practice, but also to those uh, primary care providers who work in multidisciplinary teams. 
we also wanted the guidelines to be useful for people living with obesity as a way for themselves to educate themselves on this chronic disease, but also to advocate for themselves with their healthcare providers as well as within the healthcare system. And of course, uh, Obesity Canada is a national advocacy organization as well as a scientific organization. And part of our overall mission is to uh, improve the lives of Canadians living with obesity. And by doing that, uh, our three strategic priorities are to change the way that healthcare professionals, policymakers, and people living with obesity understand and treat obesity, and uh, to increase access to obesity care. So policymakers was a clear target audience for our uh, process because we wanted to ensure that the level of obesity care that is currently available across the country is based on the latest evidence and is also patient-centered. So our approach um, started in a very systematic approach. And uh, we started, first of all, by developing a partnership between Obesity Canada and the Canadian Association of Bariatric Physicians and Surgeons. And in this partnership, we agreed that we wanted to lead the initiative together and that we wanted to focus on really shared common goals that we had as, as, as organizations in Canada. And part of what we did here was that um, the uh, Obesity Canada and CAPS executives met to decide on representatives that would sit on the executive committee that would represent those organizations and, uh, and would then decide the scope and the process for the development of the guideline. And so the second step after we signed our agreement was that the, we formed this executive committee and uh, really discussed the scope and the, um, the, the, the process for developing the guidelines. And this included really uh, finalizing and uh, discussing with the experts and patients the uh, research questions or the PICO questions that we wanted to have as part of this process. And of course, the third step after that, once we had the scope and the research questions was to conduct the evidence review. And that's where we partnered with McMaster University. And you will see uh, in the later slides how we partner with uh, the McMaster evidence review uh, team. So the evidence review, again, was using a critical appraisal of, of the evidence uh, to develop evidence-based recommendations. And of course, we had this other step, which was uh, consensus-based uh, uh, um, priority setting, as well as engagement of stakeholders to develop recommendations that, and key messages that will be practical for uh, healthcare professionals, for people living with obesity, and for policymakers. And so there was this iterative approach to final the recommendations as you, as you will see uh, later on in the presentation. And of course, the final step was to finalize those recommendations, uh, submit the, uh, the manuscript for publication and um, start the dissemination process. So one of the key uh, things to notice and to know about the development process of our guidelines is that we engaged um, a lot of participants. Um, we had 64 authors in the manuscript that was published. Uh, we engaged primary care providers, people living with obesity, indigenous communities, obesity clinicians, obesity scientists, as well as independent methods experts. We worked with professional organizations who work in different areas to make sure that we got their input and participation throughout the process. We also discussed this process and engaged policymakers. And as well, of course, we ended up working with uh, a huge team of uh, staff and volunteers, graphic designers, um, knowledge translation experts, dissemination experts, publishers, and editors. So this was an initiative that really involved uh, a number of participants that were involved at different stages of the process. And as I mentioned before, this is kind of how we structured the participation of these stakeholders. So we had the executive committee where Obesity Canada and the Canadian Association of Bariatric Physicians and Surgeons uh, participated as part of the executive committee. And, uh, and they were the body that really um, decided on the scope and the reach of the guideline. Uh, and then we had a steering committee that was composed of patients living with obesity, obesity clinicians, obesity researchers, as well as uh, independent methodologist experts. And through the external review process, we engaged even further into the community by engaging other researchers who reviewed our chapters and our recommendations, as well as more patients and community members, as well as primary care providers who provided input at the face of recommendation development. 
So for us, the engagement process was critical. Um, we wanted to have a set of clinical practice guidelines that were informed by uh, the current context in the healthcare system, that were uh, person-centered, and that were based on the evidence. So engaging um, all these stakeholders really required us to think about when do we want to engage uh, who and what do we want them uh, to engage in. And so as you can see here, we engage people living with obesity, interdisciplinary healthcare professionals, because we know that obesity care is interdisciplinary, as well as obesity scientists from the beginning. And um, the way that we did it is we, we did, we use different methods. We use focus groups, for example, to engage indigenous communities. We use surveys to engage people living with obesity. And uh, we also uh, didn't just engage them to ask them, you know, uh, what are the issues? But we also wanted them to inform the scope of their guidelines and also inform the research questions and our approach. And of course, in the review process, we engage another set of reviewers to make sure that there was a rigor and uh, independent review of every recommendation by engaging uh, independent methods experts, as well as external reviewers that could give us feedback and input about the feasibility and the practicality of the recommendations. Uh, finally, uh, we wanted the guidelines, as I mentioned, to be useful for people living with obesity and policymakers. So we had engagement for people living with obesity to finalize those key messages as well as well as policymakers. So let's discuss a little bit about the evidence review. And this was the most lengthy process uh, in our activity. And of course, this was, you know, the most rigorous process uh, to make sure that we included um, research uh, that was both quantitative and qualitative. And so our peak of questions were the grounding for that. So there were peak of questions that were more um, uh, relevant for qualitative research, as well as more PICO questions that were more relevant for quantitative research. And so we made sure that we looked at um, both quantitative and qualitative evidence throughout the uh, evidence review process. And as you can see here, the PICO questions um, and the search terms and the search strategies were designed by the authors, the executive committee and the science committee, but the literature search and the screening of the original, the first search was conducted by MERS, which is the McMaster Evidence Review and synthesis team. And uh, they screened to make sure that uh, the articles were relevant based on um, the, the search terms that we had decided. And then that's when they sent a link to this digital platform called Distiller, where authors logged in to review um, and the abstracts and the titles, and then ended up with a final list of full articles that will need to be reviewed critically to decide the level and the category of evidence. So as you can see here, this was a very lengthy process. Once the authors uh, actually appraised each study uh, and decided on the, um, the quality of the evidence, uh, MERS then went into this digital platform called Distiller to assign the grade for each paper. And then once we had the grade for each paper, authors were then asked to develop their recommendations based on the highest level of evidence. So the MERST review was critical for the development of the recommendations. Um, MERST uh, looked at the level of evidence and the grade of evidence to also suggest the terms that we need to use in the recommendations. And the executive committee reviewed all the recommendations to make sure that these terms that we use reflected the level and the grade of, of evidence that uh, the authors were looking at. Um, if they had feedback, it went back to the authors, the authors refined the recommendations. Um, and this was really an iterative process that took quite a bit of time. And I would say um, uh, we started with uh, a lot more recommendations and some of them were made into key messages. Some of them were made into full recommendations based on the evidence. Once those recommendations were um, kind of finalized by the executive committee and the authors, they went for external review with primary care providers who are practicing in primary care communities, as well as people living with obesity, uh, to really get feedback in terms of the feasibility of these recommendations for clinical practice. And again, it went back to the uh, executive committee uh, who then um, had to vote on every recommendation. And unless there was 100% consensus on that recommendation, it was not included. So all the recommendations, including this in this guideline had 100% consensus. <laughs> 
So the independent methods review, as I mentioned, is very important. This was the part where we wanted to make sure that we had a rigorous and unbiased review of the recommendations. And so there was a group of methodologists at McMaster's uh, evidence review and synthesis team who um, provided that independent review. And they were looking specifically for the clarity of the wording and the fidelity of that wording with the evidence. And uh, to highlight here is important to know that they only reviewed re recommendations that were graded A to C. Uh, they did not uh, review recommendations that were graded D. Uh, grade D recommendations were more consensus-based recommendations. So uh, the way that uh, the independent methods review was conducted was that there was at least two reviewers from MERST who reviewed all the recommendations, who then met to discuss any disagreements or any issues, and then reported back to the authors and the executive committee with their feedback and changes required. And this was, again, an iterative process. MERST reviewed the recommendations several times after they had been refined by the authors and the executive committee. So we ended up with 80 recommendations from 17 chapters. And as you can see, they're all published in the CMIJ manuscript in the summary. Um, and um, you can see that uh, the recommendations were grouped by chapter and um, that some of the chapters, of course, didn't have uh, recommendations because um, uh, there wasn't a strong level of evidence, for example, the prevention chapter. And this table really summarizes, it's, it's in the CMIJ summary. And I think it's important to see this because people who are trying to uh, replicate the guidelines, they, they really wanted to know who did what and when. And so as you can see here, here's all the activities that I've discussed and then the responsible group for those activities is listed on the right-hand side of the table. And as you can see, there was many levels of engagement uh, across uh, the executive committee and the steering committee, as well as the independent methods team. So what is very important to manage during the development of clinical practice guidelines is the conflict of interest. And I would like to clarify here that um, uh, the executive committee was responsible for overseeing the uh, conflict of interest policy that was designed at the beginning of the process. All the authors had to sign an ICMJE form um, um, throughout the process and updated uh, regularly. And none of the authors or volunteers or chapter authors received uh, payment for uh, participating in this process. And as, um, as I mentioned before, another way to mitigate conflict of interest was to have that independent methodology team at McMaster University who reviewed all the recommendations. The other thing that's important to know is that the guidelines were funded or made possible, possible through a grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research Strategic Patient Oriented Research Initiative, as well as funding from Obesity Canada and the Canadian Association of, of uh, Physicians and Bariatric Surgeons. Um, and um, this was also um, a, a significant um, amount of resource in terms of in-kind support from volunteers and participants that participate throughout this process. And this slide here, I think it's just to give you a sense of how long this process took. And as you can see, um, the discussions and the partnership agreement between Obesity Canada and CAP started in February of 2017, and the guidelines were published on August 4th of 2020. So three years, a little bit more than three years of um, iterative discussions, stakeholder engagement, evidence review, and um, participation from uh, stakeholders who have a stake in these guidelines uh, took this long. And I think it needed to take this long, uh, even though we were very ambitious at the beginning and wanted to do it in a faster way. Um, what we learned was that uh, this process needed to take a long time because it needed to engage the right people and uh, it needed to be based on the practical contextual context of Canadians living with obesity as well as the health system context that we have in Canada. And so we um, we took our time. Um, of course, we got a little bit delayed because of the COVID pandemic in the beginning of 2020, but um, the guidelines were uh, published in August of 2020. And so now that the guidelines have been published, the 
Uh, you've all have seen the uh, French and English version of this summary document that was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. And um, uh, these, uh, these, this guideline was published online on August 4th, but then uh, it was made into the front cover and first um, issue of the print cover in, uh, I believe it was September of 2020. So the online uh, publication came out in August, but the print uh, version was sent out to uh, uh, family care physicians across the country in September. And what was also um, uh, difficult uh, or more challenging for us was that um, the summary reflected the evidence from 19 chapters. And so these 19 chapters uh, were not published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, but they were part of the review process and they were the evidence for the summary document. And so these chapters were then pu published on the Obesity Canada website. And you can see if you go to the Obesity Canada website that there's uh, a page for every single chapter with key messages for healthcare policymakers, recommendations for healthcare professionals, and key messages for people living with obesity. And as well as the full chapter, all the evidence, all the references are listed on the Can on Obesity Canada's website. And of course, every chapter also has a PDF version that can be downloaded and um, used for uh, non-commercial purposes as well. Uh, with uh, the Canadian uh, Medical Association Journal, we work together to uh, launch a podcast uh, in English and French, and that was done uh, in August. Uh, the French one came a little bit later. Uh, both of these podcasts were highly well re received and um, had a lot of uh, listeners and helped us reach the target audience of uh, primary care physicians. And of course, the launch was, you know, in the middle of the Corona uh, virus pandemic, and um, it was uh, a challenging time for all of us. But during the release week, and we had over 60 million media impressions. And by the end of August of 2020, we had 81 million media impressions and close to 300 media articles. Um, this was a very positive response. There was a lot of in-depth reporting on the clinical practice guidelines from Canada um, and the key messages, including the key messages to recognize obesity as a chronic disease and as a treatable chronic disease uh, made those headlines and uh, really reached our, our general public as well. Uh, there was front page stories in the Toronto Star, the National Post, the Globe and Mail, as well as coast to coast coverage on CBC radio syndication. Um, of, of course, we also had international uh, reach with, um, with the media. Uh, there was articles uh, in the US uh, and in Europe, as well as, as well as other countries. So it was a very successful launch. And um, I, I think one of the key issues that um, we have learned is that our target audience is people living with obesity. And so how do we bring them to learn about the science of obesity, to learn about uh, the rigorous work that we've done to synthesize the evidence, to develop clinical practice guidelines. And so we created these two online communities, one for people living with obesity and one for patients. Uh, for, for healthcare professionals. And um, the community for people living with obesity is a private, moderated peer support community that focuses on evidence-based education and empowerment for individuals living with obesity. And it was created by people living with obesity. And so we've had um, several outreach and education activities through this platform, including a conference that we had in the fall of 2020, where um, several of the authors of the clinical practice guidelines spoke uh, and uh, talked about what the clinical practice guidelines mean for people living with obesity. For the healthcare professional community, we developed uh, another community online through the Time Right uh, platform. And that is specifically designed to for healthcare professionals to ask questions uh, about the guidelines and to really discuss the implications of the guidelines for their clinical practice. And of course, we've collaborated with uh, Dr. Denise Campbell uh, and her team on the Office of Lifelong Learning at the University of Alberta to develop webinars uh, for each specific chapter uh, presented by each author. And of course, we are out there trying to disseminate uh, the clinical practice guidelines through conferences. As you can see here, we have 
uh, we, uh, we shared this, the guidelines at multiple conferences in 2020 and in 2021, uh, there's more to come. We've also dedicated a lot of uh, effort to design and uh, create resources to make it easy for healthcare professionals to use the guidelines. And uh, on the Obesity Canada website, you will see the infographic with the uh, five A's approach uh, to obesity management, as well as a clinical recommendations quick guide um, that summarizes the key steps that are required for healthcare professionals to know and to practice. Of course, the, as I mentioned before, there was a lot of um, international discussion about the launch of the guideline because um, as you have seen in the previous webinars, um, we looked at uh, all the evidence and we have made significant changes in the way that we approach obesity management. Uh, the definition of obesity uh, was changed. Um, the approach to obesity management was changed. And of course, uh, those recommendations um, have raised a lot of interest internationally. And we are working with uh, Canadian partners to also make sure that these guidelines are endorsed and used in Canada. And as you, on the website, you can see which organizations have endorsed the guideline. And also we are launching on a new project to implement or to adapt the guidelines for other countries who are interested in, you know, leveraging the, the work that Obesity Canada and CAPS did for the last three years, rather than duplicating uh, all this effort, it is possible to uh, share the work that we have done and really learn from that work and apply it to different contexts. And of course, ultimately, as I mentioned, the third target audience for us is policymakers because we do need to change the way the healthcare system treats obesity and we need uh, obesity to be treated as a chronic disease. And so we have shared the uh, clinical practice guidance with um, all the policymakers, uh, politicians across the country uh, and are working towards, you know, educating healthcare uh, policymakers about the guidelines and also about the way that we need to treat obesity as a chronic disease in policies as well. And uh, Obesity Canada is mobilizing all its advocates to make sure that uh, we get obesity treated as a chronic disease in Canada. Of course, all this work is you know, uh, very important and the dissemination piece is the last piece that we need to focus on from now on. And as you can see here, um, Despite the uh, coronavirus pandemic in 2020, um, the obesity clinical practice guideline was the number one most read article in 2020 by C CMAJ readers, which is very encouraging for us to know that the, uh, the guidelines are um, reaching our intended target audience and that we hope that this uh, guideline will affect and impact their practice. Our plan is to treat the obesity clinical practice guideline as a living document, uh, rather than doing all this review uh, of the literature every 10, 15 years. Uh, we want to um, work with the authors of every individual uh, chapter to make sure that they, because they are the experts in this uh, specific topic, they will work with the Canadian, uh, the Obesity Canada Executive Committee to oversee the revisions on an ongoing basis. And we will continue to work with McMaster's evidence review system and team to make sure that we update the guidelines on a regular basis as well. And so the idea is that they will reside on the Obesity Canada website and that it will be available um, uh, as new e evidence emerges, we will update the guidelines as required uh, with the support from the executive committee. And I think this is my last slide and I'm going to open it up for discussion now, Denise. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jimena. I just would like to introduce uh, our uh, panelists joining us today, Dr. Diana Sherifali. So Dr. Diana Sherifali is an associate faculty at the School of Nursing and the inaugural Heather M. Arthur Population Health Research Institute in Hamilton uh, Health Sciences uh, Chair in Interprofessional Health Research. She's the lead of the McMaster Evidence Review and Synthesis Team, which has led multiple evidence reviews that have helped shape policy for Diabetes Canada, the Canadian Obesity Network, um, or actually now Obesity Canada, and uh, the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care. Uh, Dr. Sherifelli's research interests include uh, the implementation and evaluation of strategies to support diabetes self-management at the patient, provider, and population level, including diabetes health coaching. So welcome, Diana. I'm so pleased to have you here. And um, I do see we already have a question kicking us off in the Q&A from Barbara, um, who's asking, 
Um, as obesity treatment advocates, what are Obesity Canada and perhaps other groups doing to improve coverage for anti-obesity medications? Good question. <laughs> Should I take that? Who else wants so. to respond? Well, don't well, obesity, pop on, but. <laughs> obesity Canada has a public engagement initiative uh, and it's um, uh, basically um, in trying to mobilize patients living with obesity to advocate for themselves. And as I mentioned, that is one of the purposes of the guideline for patients living with obesity to be able to use the guideline to advocate for themselves, but also for health system change. And so we, uh, we are working with our um, advocate community uh, uh, on the ground to make sure that uh, patients have access to the uh, clinical practice guideline. Uh, we also have a, an advocacy strategy within Obesity Canada to advocate to the government to make sure that the guidelines are implemented. And so uh, there's a lot of work going on, uh, working with the medical associations to uh, declare obesity as a chronic disease and really to work with the uh, uh, even private payers to make sure that they use the guidelines uh, and uh, provide access to the evidence-based treatments that are described in the guideline. So I would suggest that if you're interested in participating, there is a community of advocates in Obesity Canada that um, would welcome your support as well. Thanks, Amanda. So Diana, I'm really, I'm just going to kick us off while we're waiting for um, the other attendees if they have questions, pop them in the Q&A. But I'm curious about your reflections on this process, um, being with a, a group that hadn't done a guideline before and picked a really easy, straightforward topic without a whole lot of scope to it. <laughs> I'm just wondering what you sort of, uh, your reflections on that from MERS perspective and, and you personally, just in terms of your, your, your take homes. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to join the panel. I think in my own reflection, um, as a clinician neuroscientist, it wasn't that far of a leap for me to consider obesity as a chronic condition and understand the complexity uh, with respect to uh, living with obesity. Um, I think there's a lot of parallels with respect to diabetes, um, whether it's psychosocial well-being, prevention, screening, treatment, et cetera. Um, as a methodologist, I think what was really provoking, but yet inspiring right out of the gates was uh, the ambitious goal that Obesity Canada set out. And I think that was um, clearly articulated through leadership, uh, but it trickled down into every single chapter and sort of the, the key target areas. So the goal was to look for the best type of evidence to advocate uh, to inform clinical practice, but to him, uh, Jimena's point, also inform uh, policy and decision makers. But I think the biggest thing was to engage patient partners and stakeholders along the way. So right out of the, the first meeting where we had uh, folks collaborate around tables, every stakeholder imaginable was at that table. Uh, patient partners, surgeons, physicians, you name it. Um, so for me, that was number one, inspiring. It was great. But then the second part was, how do we enact this as we review the literature? And Denise, you were a big, big proponent and, and champion of looking for other forms of evidence. So this wasn't necessarily drug trials. This wasn't necessarily randomized control trials, which we're all well versed in now, thanks to you know, COVID and, and vaccine trials. But rather, there's an important role of qualitative evidence, uh, the patient narrative, the patient voice. And I think what's done so beautifully throughout this entire guideline um, is the patient voice, patient perspective. And uh, kudos to Obesity Canada for sort of putting that out right at, out of the, you know, out of the gates right in the beginning. And I think that really shows uh, it's threaded through every single chapter. Thanks, Diana. I think I think um, I, I'm just curious, you know, as you guys go forward, maybe you could share a little bit with the attendees um, who may not know about distiller and and sort of that back end, like mm -hmm. Jimena alluded to it in a few of the slides, but mm -hmm. maybe you could talk a little bit about what actually is entailed on the back end with that and the scope of it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think with any systematic review process, well, actually maybe even let me let me back up a bit. 
Um, I think what's innovative with Obesity Canada's um, guidelines is that we embarked on truly a systematic review of the literature. So um, many guideline panels, guideline groups, associations um, will identify experts, content experts, clinical experts, um, and they come to the table with sort of their pile of literature, pile of evidence. You know, in other words, what are things they know to be true, depending on that context, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, whatever. Um, and that's fine. I mean, you're, similarly, Obesity Canada did that as well. The difference is that, you know, I may be just reflecting on evidence that um, influences me, that maybe speaks to me. Um, so whether it's a type of research approach, qualitative, quantitative, if I'm a particular methodologist, I only do drug trials, um, I may not be consciously or subconsciously, I may not be looking at other forms of evidence. So that being said, throughout the entire process and the whole vision of doing a systematic review is to uncover all forms of evidence that can inform a guideline. And, and truly the word systematic is we went through databases, really had strict criteria for what we were looking for, but subsequently looked at multiple databases so that no stone was unturned. And inevitably stones will be found that were not overturned. And, and so we also accounted for that as well. So with every piece of evidence that was found subsequently, let's say for example, Jimena found something, she would come to us and say, well, I found this article, was this even in your database? We would do a little bit of an audit to sort of pivot and control, are we staying in the lane? Are we still finding what we ought to be finding? So with that in, in mind, um, you know, I think we, I can't remember the exact number, but you know, hundreds of thousands of citations were found. And so from that alone, you can see that we have a huge cadre of evidence, all different forms of evidence, answering different questions for different stakeholders and different, different perspectives. So we were able to take all of that evidence and dwindle it down to the critical mass for each, each particular topic or, or, or chapter. And part of doing that is also, um, it, the, the aim is a couple things. One is to ensure trustworthiness, that we are indeed looking at this systematically, we're not cherry picking the evidence, but subsequently there's an audit trail and that's what these databases provide, is an audit trail for the search strategy, how things were selected, how things were appraised. So if there's any, ever any doubt, and you know, many people will, will face this about trustworthiness, well, someone's biased, someone has a conflict of interest, um, there were many checks and balances within the database, the reviewing process, but then also as Jimena talked about, the independent methods review was also done arm's length and then turned over to, to the chapter writers. Again, all documented, all captured in this database. And so again, it bolsters the trustworthiness, the rigor, but because it's done electronically, that also lends itself for opportunities to quickly update. And, and again, to some of Jimena's last slides about the living document, the living review, the, the ability to update on a dime, particularly as you know, novel intervention strategies, approaches come to, come to the forefront, uh, we can address it pretty quickly. As a user of that distiller methods platform, um, it was quite, uh, good for us to have uh, because that also produced the methods reports of all the evidence that was graded. Mm -hmm. And then we could look at that grade and say, okay, this is the highest level of evidence. This is the paper that has the highest level of evidence. And this is where that's what's going to inform the recommendation. So it was really easy for the authors to say, okay, instead of cherry picking, like we're saying, okay, I'm going to make a recommendation based on this, pa this paper. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we have to start with the highest levels of evidence, but also um, like Denise uh, also uh, always advocated is that, that qualitative evidence was also part of that review. Mm -hmm. So we didn't look at qualitative evidence as, you know, like this is that, you know, different type of quality or lower quality of evidence it was part of the and Denise you can explain this better but we we kind of thought of it about it as equal like we need all the evidence like uh, um, Diana saying but um, mm -hmm. we need to make the recommendations on the highest level of evidence as well as um, uh, consensus based and iterative uh, agreement between all the stakeholders so it was kind of a combination 
Yeah, as well. absolutely. Yeah, and I think you know a, a point of clarification is that Distiller SR, the actual database system. I don't have shares in it. Uh, <laughs> no conflict of interest there, but it's it's a Canadian company called Evidence uh, Partners. Um, but it's essentially a database that you can craft and sort of um, use as, as you will. And, and I would say for the last uh, at least 10 years, uh, the McMaster evidence team has been using this. So, you know, the more we use it, the more, um, you know, complex some of our work has, has, has been. And I think we're very fortunate that we have expertise in this database so that we can see, you know, how databases can export and, and you know, have data that's leveraged, in other words, methods reports for the chapter authors. I think the other thing with this database is it's really, um, you can plug and play your, your methodological framework. So uh, to Jimena's slides, you know, slides 19 and, and so forth, really talk about the classification of the level of evidence, in other words, the quality of that particular piece of literature, but then also the strength of the recommendation, which is looking at sort of the totality of the evidence, the body of evidence, and how strong, how, how certain are you that if you recommend something, how likely will this happen? And so that framework was amenable to, you know, putting into distiller with, with forms and reports. But I also think too, you know, it provided us with an opportunity to flex that framework to also include other ways of knowing, and that is the qualitative literature. So it really, for me, as a methodologist, it comes down to the question. And so qualitative questions read differently, they feel differently. The essence of what they're asking is about the patient experience, the patient uh, voice, uh, the process, whatever. So naturally we had to fit that to fit the question, the essence of the question, the methodology, and then of course the rest just fell into play. So sounds very easy, it wasn't, but it was a great learning opportunity that, that I think worked, worked out for everyone involved. I was smiling when Jimena used the word easy because I was like, oh, there's nothing, there's nothing easy about this whole thing. Uh, right. I agree, it took right? a long time. I think that was probably the longest part, wasn't it, Denise? It was a long time and it was it, it was amazing. I think one of the things those databases also do is is give the Mark One human brain sort of a place to zero in on. You know, they, it does that big search and moves from those hundreds of thousands of articles down to something, I, I think for our chapter that we wrote, we had a 500 or something plus mm -hmm. to go through, which is mm -hmm. manageable, it took mm -hmm. a while, but manageable as distinct from 50,000. So, so I think it allows you to have a broader net right? and pull, and pull things in, which was really powerful actually. Um, and, and I'm curious, even, hey, sorry, sorry, if, Diana, I, if I could ever, just- have, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to also clarify the hundreds of thousands to the to the 500 that was also leveraging and using, you know, optimal systematic review methods. So those citations were screened in duplicate. Um, and again, database supported that that type of exercise. So it wasn't paper based and we're having to share, you know, inappropriately PDF files, whatever. Um, but yeah, it really housed um, kind of the audit trail of why decisions were made and when they were made. So yeah, keeping up with, with methods was key. Sorry, I interrupted. Oh, no, no, that's okay. I actually, um, it leads to a question. I was gonna actually ask about the indigenous chapter, which was, I think a really special chapter. And I love that chapter. I think it, it, it is so rich and nuanced and, and gives so much context. Um, so I don't know, Jimena or Diana, if you wanna comment a little bit on on that process, which was a little bit different methodologically. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I can just start with sort of um, the search, the questions. Um, for us, the biggest challenge was basically uh, scarce or, or just a paucity of evidence in, in sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of the colonial traditional ways of viewing evidence. And so this really speaks to different ways of knowing. And so um, in, in working, I, I still recall, you know, the meeting where we all sat at the table and talked about the PICOs. This didn't quite fit into a typical uh, researchable question that you could disseminate into search terms like the population, the intervention, the comparison group, the outcomes. So I think what was really well done was, again, we framed, um, the opportunity to look at different ways of knowing, different evidence. 
and and I think what really spoke to our learning and our understanding about all of this was that although the typical searching methods didn't quite align, the framework offered the opportunity for uh, the Indigenous chapter to evoke um, traditional ways of knowing and embed that into their into their chapter. Yeah, I agree. And, and it, it was also for us a way to engage the community and uh, engage Indigenous researchers in the process, right, uh, as opposed to uh, just consulting. It was really a truly participatory approach where um, Indigenous leaders took the lead on that chapter and told us this is the way that we need to do this. And Obesity Canada was very happy to you know, partner with those communities to make sure that we contextualize everything and all the recommendations were, were based on what was coming from their perspective and their communities and their realities. And it was the same approach we, we use for people living with obesity, right? Because uh, people living with obesity are often not engaged in research activities. They're often excluded for, even from RCTs, uh, you know? And so we wanted them to have a voice from the beginning. And so they were part, uh, I would say it was a participatory approach that, you know, rather than as a scientist or clinicians imposing research questions, they also informed the research questions and the PICO questions, like what is relevant for you? And that, what, that's why we ended up with, I think the commercial weight loss chapter, because it was patients living with obesity who were saying, we need to have this knowledge. We need to know what is the evidence behind all these commercial weight loss products uh, that we are, engaging or buying or are assigning to and you know, we don't have the evidence and so you know that was a direct response to us listening to what patients wanted to know and and developing that research to in response to that and it was the same thing in the indigenous communities I think it was um, uh, I think that's why it took us three and a half years almost <laughs> because we needed to know what, what, what are the issues right like we can't guess what the issues are and um, I think oftentimes in research, we tend to be like, oh, we're the research experts and we know everything, but it's the community. It was the primary care physicians that needed to tell us, this is what's important for us. And this is what we need to know. Like, don't just give me recommendations that I cannot implement. And where would you say, um, like, Diana, have you ever seen this before? I mean, you know, you know, guidelines inside, outside, backwards, forwards and sideways. Have you, have you ever seen anything similar in terms of integration of these different ways of knowing in a guideline before? Um, I, I think there's threads of this, in, it, it, um, threads of this sort of complex ways of knowing and integrating. Um, the closest that I could say that has come to this was probably the 2018 iteration of the Diabetes Canada guidelines. And for a couple of reasons, one was, you know, there were, patient stakeholders involved, but not to the degree of, you know, as Jimena <clears throat> referenced, the participatory action kind of approach. Um, where Diabetes Canada threads the integration component of, you know, what does this mean for someone with a lived experience is the uh, patient key messages and then provider key messages. Um, but the participatory action, to use Don, uh, Jimena's um, language here was right from inception from the first kickoff meeting to get everyone on the same page you know the first um you know presentation uh was really you know why are we doing this who is this for what is this about um i think it set a tone and a tenor across kind of the vision the vision was executed with the chapters um but but most importantly it was integrated into every single question so, uh, you know, why were interventions important, commercial based uh, solutions or, or uh, products? Uh, what were the outcomes that were relevant? You know, so clinicians historically have thought of obesity as weight, weight, weight. Well, we're hearing something totally different from patient partners, right? And so I think this particular guideline is so unique in that it's infused this sort of holistic perspective. And let's be frank, that's probably why it's been you know, ranked by CMAJ is one of the top read articles. It was on CNN, I think, because it's very provocative from that perspective. So Obesity Canada, trailblazers for sure. Um, I just think more people are sort of picking up on what was done and, and how did they rejig their, their guidelines to, to reflect this perspective. Yeah, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just from a, so from a sort of wonky perspective of, of people who are interested in guideline development, do you think that this kind of approach for certain guidelines, uh, perhaps of other conditions would be, would be useful? And do you think people would be open to taking it up? Well, that's, I, I think that's a good question. Um, and it's probably a complex question because I think this really depends on, you know, a vision, resources, time to Jimena's point, you know, three plus years. I don't know if that's the gestation of an elephant, but <laughs> I feel like I heard that somewhere. Um, uh, so, but I think it all begins with, you know, the, the complex nature of obesity or the complex nature of other conditions. You know, there's many frameworks to develop guidelines and it's great if you have, you know, does this drug prevent these outcomes? You know, that follows a different structure that has a different tone, a different feel to it. It's a very binary decision. Are we going to recommend this or not? But I think for complex issues that um, parlay across so many levels of our healthcare, but also social networks, um, obesity, primary care, population based, uh, where we work, how we work, especially in COVID, um, I think this really warrants a more complex um, sophisticated approach and, and it all begins with you know bringing everyone to the table to really understand the complex nature of this from a holistic perspective and and that word comes to mind holistic because I really see this as sort of a mixing of multiple perspectives mixing of multiple um, methodologies all framed within sort of a guide work that you know the 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 uh, evidence review perspective of the systematic review, the literature, but then also the um, guiding framework of how did we assess the literature, but then how did we guide the grading recommendation. So as long as that's transparent, I think including different perspectives is, is um, you know, unique, but, you know, we had a framed guide to, to help, uh, help us navigate. And where it didn't quite, you know, allow some liberties, um, that's where we were able to expand on the methodologies for sure, Denise, with the qualitative nature of our, of our evidence. Mm -hmm. How do you so think- it was, a, uh, it was a fun project, wasn't it, Diana? Are you happy with it? <laughs> but I remember that first meeting, and you remember <laughs> that first meeting, Denise, and I was like, we're going to do this in one year. I, yes, <laughs> I, I, I'll go on the record as saying one year. Um, I, I think, but but I, I also would, would um, you know, again, lessons learned. I think the mm -hmm. complexity of um, the type of evidence we reviewed, but then also, you know, the reality is, is a lot of people were doing this um, in, in, you know, on a volunteer basis. Yeah. Um, these things take time. So, yeah. I um, think that's my one, number one lesson that I underestimated how, how long it would take. And um, like from a resource perspective for a registered charity like Obesity Canada to take this on uh, without knowing how, like, like I really, it's the first time that we do guidelines. And so uh, uh, obviously we had a huge, an army of volunteers that, you know, were very committed and very passionate about this and we couldn't have done it without them, right? And mm -hmm. so a lot of people ask me, you know, how did Obesity Canada do this with CABS? And I think it was just, I think a lot of people in Canada are very passionate about this. A lot of Obesity Canada members and CAPS members are very, very passionate and they really truly wanted to change the way that we treat obesity and change care and really change the whole narrative of obesity. And so it wasn't a small task. Um, I should have probably guessed that when we had the first executive committee and when we did our scoping uh, mapping exercise and we had all these ideas and there was like hundreds of research questions and I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> but we're here we did it thank you diana for well, everything thank you diana thank you for the opportunity and i think i, I might just <laughs> add to um you know th setting the foundation and setting the process is always painful and difficult but i think now that we have th the framework the databases the process down pat um I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, where does Obesity Canada go next? And I, I really like the idea of, of living guidelines. Um, I think that's also um, extending the methodologies and sort of the science of how are we able to adapt and adopt recommendations quickly based on, you know, the nature of evidence and how quickly evidence is generated. So stay tuned.
<laughs> I love the fact that OBC Canada gave themselves all of four months before they started the pediatric guidelines. <laughs> and Diana's helping us with that too. So <laughs> I was like, so Diana, do you see that as being the same, the same undertaking as the adult guidelines? How is that shaping up so far? So that's shaping up to be a little bit different and different primarily because of the methodology and the methodology sort of dictates kind of um, rules of engagement, if you will. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the patient perspective and, and family and caregiver perspective is absolutely captured. So um, in terms of identifying the outcomes that are most relevant for patients and, and their families, et cetera, informal caregivers, that is certainly reflected. Um, I think with the pediatric population, um, you know, the questions will be a little bit more nuanced. Um, I think, quite frankly, there's a paucity of, of literature with respect to pharmacotherapies, um, surgical interventions. Uh, we have a lot to work through in terms of lifestyle, uh, the physical activity, nutrition combined approaches. Um, so I think they, they perhaps have a little bit of freedom in terms of being very targeted and very specific with their questions. And so the nature of their questions are dictating a slightly different approach. But at the end of the day, we can reassure folks, um, users or um, end users of the guidelines is that number one, it's rigorous. The literature is systematically reviewed. Um, critically appraised to the point where, you know, conflicts of interest are minimized. Uh, the the uh, guidelines are um, dealt with, you know, uh, critically appraised at an arm's length distance. And I think at the end of the day, the outcomes and what is um, deemed as important and relevant is infused with patient, family and caregiver perspectives. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's just brilliant. I think um, Jimena, Diana, thank you so much for taking time today and really giving us a deep dive into this. And um, I think looking back on it, everyone is so pleased and proud. I mean, I know it was super difficult at times. Um, there was a lot of new bits being done. Diana was a soul of um, calm in the whole thing. And Jimena, Don, and all the colleagues at BC mm -hmm. Canada, and all the volunteers, the patient advisory committee, all of the different, uh, all the different people who contributed, I think, um, can be really proud that I think we actually achieved what we set out to do three and a half years ago, and uh, and that's awesome. And hopefully, it's going to translate into some new care and some new approaches and some new understandings at the system levels. And thanks to to all of our attendees um, for coming. And I know a lot of people are downloading this. Uh, as well as a, as a sort of webinar asynchronously. So thanks to everybody for your interest and for participating in these rollout of the guidelines. Um, we're gonna keep going on all the KT and implementation. And I'm glad Diana's working on the pediatric stuff. I'm gonna be very excited to see those guidelines when they come out.